Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to this panel discussion about the outlook for European investment uh, in the light of uh, uh, geopolitical uncertainty. Uh, my name is Andrea Ciccione. I'm uh, Head of Investment Strategy at Lomba Street Research, and I'm joined today uh, by three very distinguished panelists and, uh, and strategists. Um, uh, Joe Little, um, Chief uh, Global Strategist at HSBC uh, Global Asset Management. Then Michael Bryan, uh, CIO for EMEA, um, JP Morgan Asset Management. Uh, and Martin Luke, uh, Chief Investment Strategist for Germany, Austria and Eastern Europe uh, at BlackRock. Uh, we've only got 30 minutes, so we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, but before we get started, let me just explain how I'd like this discussion to be structured. So we look at Europe from three, three perspectives, uh, from a macro point of view, then politics, and then finally financial markets. So let's jump right in uh, with macro. Uh, I, I think it makes little sense to look at Europe in isolation, and uh, maybe it's important to set the scene first, uh, looking at global uh, macro. Um, our view at uh, Lombard Street Research is that uh, the reflation theme might have lost some momentum lately, but growth remains fairly solid. Uh, we think that the global cycle will continue to be propelled forward by three uh, global um, engines or locomotives, as we like to call them. The US, Germany, increasingly becoming Europe as a whole, and China. And this makes the cycle much more resilient uh, to shocks than it's been uh, ever since the recovery started in 2009. So, Mike, maybe uh, starting with you, uh, what's your take on the global macro picture? Do you buy into this global synchronized growth story? And uh, more importantly, what, what's happened to reflation? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's only taken eight years uh, and a hell of a lot of, uh, of uh, monetary policy. But uh, I think for the first time since 2011, we are seeing synchronized growth across the major economies. I mean, emerging markets have come in line over the last 12 months. But I would say the US, we'd, we'd characterize the US as being sort of late cycle. Europe's coming on sort of early mid-cycle. Um, but like I said, it's, it's, hard, it's, it's hard not to be optimistic uh, about synchronized growth right now, given the amount of uh, focus by the monetary authorities and, 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 and governments uh, to get jobs and growth in, uh, in, in place. Uh, I, I would say that um, you know, if you look at the PMI and, and the sentiment indicators here in Europe, it is indicating sort of a 2% growth in GDP. Um, I think reflation, let's not forget, reflation was in place before Trump. So I think that sort of became a synonymous with Trump. Uh, I think there's been some indicators in the first quarter in the U.S. to indicate that inflation has fallen away. That, we think that's more technical. Uh, but you will see inflation. It's subdued. It's slow. Um, but you know, everything is slower. I mean, uh, we look at the sort of long-term forecast. If you had a 60-40 equity bond portfolio 10 years ago, you'd be expecting 7%, seven, 7.5% seven return. You know, our work now, based on productivity and GDP growth, you're probably looking at maybe 5 5 5.5%. So, you know, I think what we're seeing is slower, easier. I, I think we're not going to see any exceptional growth. So trend growth will generally be the story for us. Uh, and we do believe in a synchronized growth. But it has taken, it has taken eight years to get here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin, <clears throat> investors' fear of uh, a Chinese slowdown. Uh, our research indeed slows that... China's growth is slowing, but from exceptionally strong growth in Q1. Um, so we think that over the course of 2017, uh, growth should settle at about potential levels around 6, 6.5%. Uh, do you think that China will continue to contribute positively to the global synchronized growth story uh, and reflation story? So do you think it's going to be more of a drag in 2017? Well, certainly in the short term, China will contribute positively to global growth, first of all, because the Chinese cannot afford a, sh a too sharp slowdown. And this is the, the thing they, they fear most, because China, China is not a, dem a democracy. It's, it's, a, it's a very rigid uh, political system. So if anything, they cannot afford, it's, it's, a, it's a too sharp political slowdown that, that creates uh, unemployment. So what the Chinese have done is they have actually channeled down their GDP growth numbers in order to make us all believe that they are kind of not hitting uh, the wall and that they are set for a, for a soft slowdown of their economy. So um, if they tell us the number for this year will be 6.5%, 6.5% it will be, we already know. Uh, the question is what is underneath? And what, we're, what is actually underneath is some that the Chinese economy, what you can read from uh, high frequency data, what you can hear from grassroots indicators, um, things like uh, the Li Keqiang index and things like that, that growth is accelerating right now. So the growth number, and you could see that in Q1, 
So I have no idea if at the end of the year we will see the 6.5 number in the data. But what we can see from underneath is that the, right now the Chinese economy is accelerating and uh, political authorities, policymakers are even trying to slow it down a bit. You can see it from the People's Bank of China. It's, it's trying to rein in excessive credit growth. Um, so right now the Chinese economy is, is without any doubt contributing positively to global growth. Okay, uh, Joe, maybe uh, looking at the US for a moment, um, Trump's election last year raised hopes of fiscal stimulus and infrastructure spending, um, but also fears of protectionism and even trade wars. Well, concerns about trade wars, of course, uh, have uh, faded somewhat, uh, and that's obviously a welcome development. Um, but what about the tax plan and investment? Uh, do you think that are, they're, are they going to happen anytime soon, and uh, what would that mean for growth and inflation? Okay, so, so this is a key question, and, and the honest answer, I think, is that it's, it's, it's very hard to know, at least with, with, with confidence. As, as you remember, Andrea, at the end of last year, um, we had this sort of Trump bump theme in markets, a lot of confidence really building among market participants, that we would see a broader economic reflation. And that's come out of market pricing as we've moved through, through this year so far. And, and I think really what market participants have begun to become more aware of is this, this regime of political gridlock, which, which continues and persists in the US. But, but to what Mike was saying, a lot of the themes that we've seen developing in terms of the uh, improvement in the growth inflation mix, they predate the, 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 the US election. And it's not just, of course, about the US as well. So we've seen the end of fiscal austerity um, uh, across major advanced economies, so much so that the IMF are now telling us that, that governments are going to support growth this year. They're going to add about 40 basis points to global growth in the G7 economies this year. That's an unusual state of affairs relative to what we've experienced in the past. So I think the growth inflation mix uh, is, is, is still improving related to this reflation theme. Um, and, and what's important as well is that the inflation scenario that market participants, especially in government bonds, are assuming, are pricing, is really a much more cautious interpretation at this point. So I think that means that if we do see a delivery of, of the tax plan, if we do see a delivery of a greater fiscal stimulus, that, that, that's got the potential then to be a, a significant surprise to people in the market. That's got, a, got, got the potential to be a significant surprise to people's perception of growth, to people's perception of the future rate outlook as, as well. Excellent. Um, well, let's talk about the Fed for a minute. Um, Mike, what's your outlook for um, the path for policy rates? Well, I mean, uh, first of all, I would say with the Fed, like a lot of the, uh, of the other monetary authorities, they'll, they'll basically tend to be behind the curve, and they'll be very accommodative and very careful. Um, so I think for, you know, we'll see them react and, 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 uh, more than actually lead. Mm. Uh, I think we how, will see. How careful? The market's pricing in 25 basis point increase. Yeah, well, today, I, well I think the market under, underestimates also the number of hikes. I mean, our <laughs> view is the Fed will want to get to 0% real um, as a policy target. And they'll get there, so again, in a sense of planning but reacting. So we would we'd expect that we'll get three hikes this year, and we think three hikes next year. Now, the market, you know, our view is the market, the market changes its mind on a, on a dime. We saw the ahead of the last uh, rate hike. So I think the they, Fed will want to get to 2%. We'll want, they'll, they'll, they'll against a, a, an inflation target of 2%, um, and they'll get there over 2017 and 18. Uh, like I said, the issue would be at what pace will the U.S. hit recession? And again, our view, if you look at the, the history of late cycle economies in the U.S., it can be anywhere from two quarters to 16 quarters. So, you know, we'd we, we be expecting 2019, we'll see some stresses and recessionary pressure, but ahead of that, we'll see that the Fed get towards 2% uh, and, and zero real. Understood. Um, but when we're talking about the Fed, it's not just about rates, uh, as we know. There, there's been a lot of talk about quantitative tightening, which is probably a bit of a misnomer, Joe. But um, the Fed seems determined to shrink its balance sheet over the next few years. That's been flagged very, uh, very openly. Um, the Fed clearly wants to avoid any tantrums this time around. Uh, what's your take on this? Do you think that the Fed will, will use the balance sheet as a monetary policy tool, or it, does it just want to, to normalise the size of the balance sheet and uh, will continue to focus on rates uh, in terms of... Uh, yeah, policy tool. Yeah, okay. I think you're right, Andrea. I think what we're going to see is, is, is a combination of use of the balance sheet with, with, with interest rates. Um, I mean, this tightening cycle is, is unique versus any sort of historical precedent because we're tightening rates with a $4.5 trillion balance sheet. So, so it's unprecedented, really, in terms of, in terms of the scenario that, that we're facing. Um, 
my sense is that, 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 that it's probably a mistake to over, over, over um, focus on, on the balance sheet, both from a policy side and, and, in, and from a macro and, and market side, just because I think a large balance sheet gives you a lot, of, lot more flexibility in terms of the, um, uh, of the, the policy stimulus you can provide to the economy at a, at a, at a later date. But the effect that this then has on the economy, this, this, this twin strategy of, of, of balance sheet compression with rates, the effect that that then has on the economy and financial markets is really, really quite interesting. And I suspect the surprise, if anything, is that it might be, might be less than we, we expect. And, and the reason for that really is because if you go back to the impact that quantity easing had in the first, the first instance, that, that's, that's sort of disputed still in the, in the academic community. So there's, there's, there's some uh, uh, ambiguity about the true effects that that, 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 then, that then had. And of course, when we've seen previous phases of adjustment to the Fed balance sheet, such as the taper tantrum episode in, in 2013, that created a big wobble in financial markets at, at that point. But, but that was a, um, a adjustment of the balance sheet that was occurring in an economic environment that's very different to the one we face today. Right. So as Mike says, we, we think we're in a, a sort of synchronized growth environment. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd very much endorse that, that idea. And, and, and that makes the system a bit more resilient to these sort of uh, adjustments on, 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 on the balance sheet side. Um, so much so that, 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 that I think we can, we can kind of make the slightly provocative conclusion that the surprise could be um, that the balance sheet adjustment doesn't have the kind of effect on the economy that, that many people um, in the economist's profession or, or in the market might, might, might sort of fear. And it could be that the real impact of all of this is just on the shape of the yield curve rather than on the economy sort of per se. Okay. Um, well, let, let's finally move on to Europe. That's uh, the subject of this panel anyway. Um, so the ECB last week revised their inflation forecasts down and their growth forecasts up. Um, Q1 GDP figures were also revised up and the composition showed um, good domestic demand. And it, this suggests that growth should continue to be fairly strong uh, in coming quarters as well, around uh, 2% for the year. So, Martin, strong growth, low inflation, the ECB clearly and openly talking about no risk of deflation anymore. Is this Goldilocks? Is it too good to be true? Any risk to this, uh, to this outlook? Well, it's, it's, it's definitely um, a, a, pretty, a, a pretty positive environment, a, a pretty good environment. It's, it, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it Goldilocks because the euro crisis is not over. We are still in repair mode. Um, and uh, if you listen to the, to the speech that, that Yanis Varoufakis gave earlier this morning, uh, there is very much um, of a dis disequilibrium inside of Europe and, and there is very much that, that still needs to be repaired, including um, the uh, excessive debt of many um, jurisdictions, uh, the, the public households in the first place, uh, including uh, the banking crisis that is still lingering on, and including the third crisis that the euro crisis has been all about, and that is uh, the disequilibrium of current accounts and uh, con competitiveness across the eurozone in the first place. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a Goldilocks scenario. Um, despite that, uh, it is of course um, a pretty benign scenario, especially if you compare it to the previous couple of years. And this is the first time now that um, almost every single um, Euro European country has a positive growth rate, last quarter except of Greece. Um, that, that, that is definitely a positive scenario. And um, if there is now this conundrum of growth accelerating and inflation not quite there yet, I would think that this is very much um, a reflection of the fact that Europe is a credit channel economy and the transmission channel that is inside of the banking system still needs to be repaired. Europe is four to five years behind the United States in terms of repairing the transition mechanism. And you've been talking about the Fed balance sheet before. Why is the Fed in a position to reduce the balance sheet right now? And why is it very, much, very unlikely that this will have a very significantly negative impact on, on the markets? This is why at the same time, the money multiplier has come back. Because you need to expand your balance sheet from a macro perspective if you, if you, if you don't have your, your money multiplier working, right? And what is not happening in Europe yet is that the multiplier is working to the extent that it should be. So uh, it is not Goldilocks, but it's an improving scenario. And this is also the time um, when um, reforms, for example, in France, where this is now on the cards, uh, can be addressed uh, with some degree of um, likelihood to, su to succeed. Excellent. All right, let's move on to the second section of this, uh, this discussion, which is politics, trying to keep it uh, 
uh, short because it's been discussed uh, quite a bit by the speakers before us. Um, well, at the end of last year, after Brexit and the surprise win by Trump, uh, it seemed as if the anti-establishment um, trend was all the rage in politics. And understandably, the commentary going into 2017 was all about political risks with three uh, key elections uh, due to be held in Europe. Now, uh, elections in, uh, in the Netherlands, in France, and most likely in Germany turned out to be not the, uh, the shock events that many had feared. Um, but then we had the, the unexpected general election in the UK, and we all know how that one ended, and possibly another uh, election in Italy uh, later this year, not to mention the recent call by Catalonia to call for an independence referendum uh, in October. Uh, Mike, going back to you, um, uh, after Macron's win, Mark, one could have been forgiven for thinking that um, uh, we had seen peak populism, and finally investors could have started focusing on micro uh, and macro fundamentals. Um, What's, a, what's your take on this? Are political risks still a threat to be reckoned with, or are we past the worst? No, I mean, political risk has always been in the system. Um, and I would say that when, when, when political risk manifests itself, markets reprice it immediately and then get back to fundamentals. So I think, I think it's not a question of political risk sort of having been here and now gone. It will it, remain in, in all forms and fashion. I would say in populism, you know, I think the threat of populism is receding in Europe, but don't forget, populism generally hasn't come with a clear mandate. It's generally filled a gap when the existing incumbents have failed. Right. Um, so I do think if you look at the UK, you know, we found that the, the, the Labour Party went, went, sort of went very left. Um, we thought the Conservatives went very right. Uh, and what you got was a hung parliament, which is basically the population voting for a centrist government. Um, so I think, in effect, you know, we actually got the right outcome. I think we heard that this morning. Um, so I, you know, populism sort of fills a gap when the incumbents have failed. Uh, and I think we'll find that threat will still will be receding. I do worry that when a, a government like Macron uh, gets in and there's a huge amount of stock and trade put in, that being the new future, if, if, if Macron fails, I think we will have some serious issues because I think that's when you do find that you, know, you get a centrist government uh, with a clear mandate not delivering. And against all the points raised this morning, there's high expectations. So I think the threat has receded. Uh, and I think you know, Europe has been the point at which we've sort of put that global block on. You know, if you look at Trump, you know, the view that he's going to bring jobs back to the U.S. You know, if you look at 2000 to, to 2015, you know, the manufacturing industry in the U.S., the number of jobs went from 20 million to about, say, uh, I'd say about 13, 14 million. So the view being they were all exported. 80% of that, those jobs were lost through automation. Okay, only 20% went offshore. That's right. So you start to think about some of the populist agenda actually is built on sand. So, like I said, I worry about some of the, the, sort of the, the facts that are out there around it. Two, the, the failure of centrist governments or incumbents will revive populism. But right now, I think that threat has receded. So, uh, yeah, the worst is behind us, yeah. but um, political it's, risks will always be there, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Um, uh, Joe, talking about the UK, um, what does a Tory um, a DUP coalition uh, or minority government uh, is going to mean for Brexit uh, and for the negotiations? Does that mean a softer Brexit? Or does it rather increase the risk of a messy no-deal outcome? <laughs> I thought I might get away without, as the British guy, being asked about, about <laughs> Brexit, but, but clearly... Yeah. Oh, I'm keen on this one as well. There's, yeah. there's no escape. There's no escape from this topic. Um, yeah, OK, so, I mean, clearly the political situation in the UK is, 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 is in flux. There's um, uh, lots of sort of gossip and, and, and discussion of, of what's going to happen even over the next few days on, on Twitter and, and, and social media. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of Brexit, I think it's very tempting, as you, as you highlight, and, Andrea, to, 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 to read into the results of the UK election and, and the aftermath of, 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 of that result, to read into that result that, that the hard Brexit scenario is now completely off the table, that we can rule it out completely. My sense is that's quite a dangerous assumption. Um, in, in, in the UK um, today, there, there, there's a huge amount of noise uh, um, about, about, about this uh, um, topic and this debate. This sort of hard Brexit versus soft Brexit um, uh, uh, debate goes on. It's, it's very unclear um, what, the, what the direction forward should be, even with a, a sort of a cross-party consensus. It's very unclear on what, what that really actually means in practice. So, so, so my sense is that it's, it's hard to read too much into the result at this point. We, we can't rule out the hard Brexit scenario. We need to think in this uncertain time of multiple scenarios as, as possible routes forward. But, but, but I think as a, as a sort of a working rule of thumb, it seems quite realistic to me that 12 months down the line, 
18 months down the line, these negotiations have sort of carried on, and actually we've not really made that much progress. This right. could be a story that sort of runs and, and runs and runs. Okay. Um, and uh, Martin, maybe taking the European perspective here, what, what do you think the EU27 approach to the negotiation will be with the UK, without even talking about a punishing deal, which has been uh, floated as an option? Uh, um, c can the EU afford to offer Britain a good deal that is economically beneficial for both, or as Gianni Varoufakis suggested earlier, uh, this would just suggest other to follow in the UK's uh, footsteps? No, no, I think that, that uh, Yanis Varoufakis was completely right here. The, the, the EU cannot accept a positive deal. There, can no, there cannot be any attractive blueprint for any other EU country to, to drop out. This is totally unacceptable. This is not in the rule book of the European Union. So uh, what, I, what I can tell you is, the, is that the European, and actually you can see it, that the, the position of the European Union even hardened since the, uh, the Brexit talks have started officially after the, after the letter was sent, uh, after, after the, uh, um, um, the departure letter was sent, um, that the, the, uh, the, the, the amount of money that Britain needs to, still needs to pay to the EU was, was lifted from 60 billion to 100 billion. Yeah. You can see that the position was even made harder. So there are three things that the EU will negotiate. One is uh, border issues like Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. Second is the rights for EU citizens in, in the UK and vice versa. The tricky thing here is the jurisdiction of the, e, of the uh, European Court of Justice that is totally unacceptable to the British authorities. And the third ar argument is money. So only once the British government, any British government, agrees to have this line of order and this uh, the, the, the negotiations in this line of order, will there be uh, the possibility to negotiate at all? And let us not forget that there is only maximum one year to negotiate because ne serious negotiations will not start before the autumn of this year. And then they will drag into the autumn of next year because then there is another half year or so for the ratification process in 28 countries. So there is only maximum one year to negotiate all this and I, I see very little chances of... Uh, of avoiding um, a cliffhanger solution, yeah. which eventually will probably lead to a to kind of a transition period of four, five or six mm -hmm. years where, where Britain will stay very close to the EU, EU but outside officially. So kind of a, a transitory soft Brexit solution. Understood. So investors should be bracing for a lot of volatility going forward, which takes us to the next section of this talk, which is markets. I mean, so <coughs> far the year, virtually half the year is behind us already. And, um, uh, investment returns have been fantastic. Uh, all asset classes posting positive returns, but clearly the picture that's emerging is that stocks have massively outperformed returns, dollar returns in the region of 10-20%. Um, second in the ranking is uh, corporate debt, uh, and then finally uh, government bonds, uh, all of them except the um, return about 4% or below. Um, Joe, where do you think we are in the cycle, in the global cycle, investment cycle I'm talking about here? Are we in the sort of Goldilocks scenario where the output cap is still negative but closing, which means about potential growth and low inflation? Or are we already in the, 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 the overheating stage where growth is slowing uh, but inflation rises? And how should investors allocate their money? What asset classes should they own very quickly? Yeah, okay, so I, 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 mean, I think the tone of the conversation, I'm gonna, I'm gonna echo um, something that's already come out. I think we're seeing synchronized growth. I think we're seeing a low inflation environment. Output gaps not yet moving positive globally. We're not yet in that sort of overheating zone. Uh, it is a fragile equilibrium. We're sort of balancing these concerns around, around, around growth challenges, potentially from, from China, and, and then upside growth and, and the risk of overheating as you as you highlight in, in, in your question. But this is an environment where growth looks, looks pretty good, at least cyclically, um, where inflation trends are gradually building, particularly in the US. It's clearly an environment which favors equities over, over safety assets like global government bonds. And what's more, it's not just about relative macro and, 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 and relative, relative profits. Um, that, that sort of conclusion is underpinned by the relative valuation uh, uh, situation too. So our, our sort of quantitative work looking at, looking at relative valuation points to an equity risk premium, uh, an, an excess return associated with global equities relative to, to government bonds of around 4% today. And that's a pretty good relative return. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, the rewards for investors are still available um, uh, in, in, in the sort of volatile asset classes, parts of the equity market, particularly Japan, Asia, um, Europe to a degree, although obviously it's done, it's done, it's done very, very well. 
and, and, and also in parts of the emerging markets. So um, both in the, in the local currency debt space and in the, and in the equity space. It's these risky assets where, where, there's, where, where there can be volatility, but that's where the relative rewards seem to be today. They should continue to benefit from uh, global uh, trade trends, which remains... Yeah, I think robust. so. I mean, the, as, as, as after the strong market performance that we've seen, as, 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 as you say, the nature of the bet changes a little bit. So it becomes less about extreme valuation... Um, which, which, which we might have identified at, at, at the sort of turn of the year or, or the midpoint of, 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 of last year. And, and it's a little bit more about, about the, the momentum trends as well, macro momentum, price momentum. That's sort of supporting the story. But I think you can still make a case that it, this is growth at a reasonable price. Got it. Uh, Mike, a widely held view is that European equities should continue to outperform other markets this year, notably the United States. Uh, and that, that would break a trend of underperformance that's been in place at least since 2008, if not more. Can these finally happen? And if it does, how long can Europe carry on outperforming the United States? If you look at it, when, when global growth is at or around trend, generally the, the U.S. tends to underperform. Um, if you look at where Europe's come from uh, over, over the last five years, it's underperformed the U.S. by 60%. Um, if you look at the environment that we've now got in Europe in terms of the corporates, the strength of their balance sheets, you know, we, we are very much, so in terms of the preferences of equity markets worldwide, Europe would be top of our list in terms of the, the potential uh, uh, performance over, over 2017 and 18. So if you look at the operational leverage European companies have, uh, if you look at the subdued inflationary environment, uh, if you look at the economic growth, then we would actually have the, uh, the European equity market outperforming the US market by, in 2017 and 18. That would probably add the, uh, the central bank stance as well. Yeah, to, yeah to the it helps, yeah. yeah. Um, well, Martin, uh, let's zoom in some more. Uh, the best performing equity markets in Europe here today are Spain and Germany. Uh, Spain is a great recovery story. Uh, Germany is benefiting from global growth, global trade, uh, and a very competitive exchange rate. Um, do you think that Germany will beat Spain to the end of the year finish line, or will other markets take leadership here, or actually doesn't it does it make sense at all to talk about country indices and should investors instead focus on sectors rather than countries? Well, with regard to the latter part of your question, it probably depends on the sector that you look at. Some of, and, and some of the sectors are more, are more global, others are more, more domestic or more regional. And, and that, that, of course, um, in that regard, it makes sense to look at sectors rather uh, than comparing countries or regions. Uh, if you look at the technology sector, for example, which is a global sector. And um, so, so that needs to be differentiated. The, the other one, um, which market beats uh, the other ones to the finish line, is, is a question. What springs to mind, for example, is France. Uh, France. If really Macron comes around with uh, reforms um, going forward and really puts them into place in a credible form, and um, the, the, the litmus test, obviously, is not... Um, resistance in Parliament, but resistance in the streets of France. But uh, you know that remains to be seen. Um, if, the, if that were to be the case, France would be one of the uh, markets that could perform best in the second half of this year. Um, and then again, I think it's it's very much a question to what extent um, the uh, global reflation trade continues. Uh, to what extent uh, different parts of the world actually make it to grow, uh, for example, Asia in comparison to the Americas, and of course, Americas to to a very large extent a call on uh, the ability of the Trump administration to put some of their promises into place. Um, so I would think it will be a, a, a narrow race, and I would not completely um, forget about France when you talk about the probably most prospective um, markets in Europe. Okay. Um, maybe you've got time for a very quick set of questions um, to, to each of you. Um, uh, Joe, uh, the ECB will likely announce a further step down in, uh, in the size of their QE monthly purchases in September. Yep. Uh, first of all, do you agree with this view? Uh, and what do you think is going to happen to European government bond yields? Yeah, OK. So I think, I mean, I think that's a reasonable base case. So, so I guess we'll be talking about this during the course of Q4, or, or, or maybe already uh, as we move into, into Q3. Uh, and, and the ECB will actually be sort of enacting the taper in, 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 in 2018. And that's justified on... On, on better growth and, 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 a, and a change in assessment of the growth view that, that's been already been represented to us by, by the ECB. The only thing I would, I, I would say is, obviously, the inflation trends remain, remain incredibly uh, subdued, incredibly uh, uh, soft. And, and the projections from the ECB about inflation are also 
uh, incredibly, incredibly benign in terms of the near-term outlook. So there's a risk that either that, that decision around the taper gets moved into the sort of middle of, 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 of 2018, or perhaps it takes the entirety of 2018 for the, for the taper theme to play out. So I think that's, that's, that's the worry. And of course, given that inflation uh, um, uh, scenario, this sort of normalization environment is gonna, is, is, is gonna run for, for a while. And we're sort of so you don't expect, out. say, boom yields to move up? 100 basis points anytime soon. Well, the market reaction can, can be tricky, of course, and, 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 and particularly in global bonds, <clears throat> excuse me, at the moment, they're not, global bonds are not only discounting very low interest rates, but also very negative term premium. Mm. So there's, there's still scope for, for the long end, not just in Europe, but, but, but in other global bond markets too, to, 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 be, to, be, to be volatile, even, even with only slight pressure from, from, the, from the policy side. So, so the scope for that sort of market misbehavior yeah. to, to, to play out for sure given where pricing is today. Okay, got it. Uh, Mike, um, are U.S. Treasuries as grossly overvalued as booms are? I mean, if you look at uh, growth inflation differentials between U.S. and Europe, or Germany specifically, there's not much difference to justify 200 basis points of, uh, of spread. No, no, I mean, our, our view is that we do think, uh, we do think uh, yeah, bonds and European bonds will lead yields higher uh, to the end of this year and beginning of next year. So our view right now is we think that Treasuries are expensive because we've been in overreaction uh, year to date in terms of the, the, the inflation uh, um, announcements. We do think Treasuries tens will get to 3%. Um, and we, th we, think, uh, we think bonds sitting at 25 right now, we're probably looking at 75 to 100 basis points. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and finally, very quickly, Martin, uh, talking about the euro, the ECB's dovish stance uh, last week took some of the froth out of the, uh, the euro dollar exchange rate. Um, but it still looks a bit overvalued if you look at a number of metrics, including interest rates, differentials, yield differentials. Um, do you think investors are too bullish? I mean, looking at positioning, it looks like they're very long. Where, where, and where do you see euro dollar at the end of the year? Well, let's not forget that from a fundamental perspective, purchasing power parity, the euro is undervalued at the current uh, level. So the purchasing power parity is 129. So um, I think um, with everything remaining equal, we will probably see the euro dollar moving in this band uh, of roughly 110 to 115 versus the end of the year unless you have big changes or big surprises in monetary policy stance, which I would not expect. So my best guess would be to see the euro dollar in this uh, narrow range of 110 to 115 by the end of the year. And converging towards some sort of fair value 130 over what time horizon? Well, this is a very, you know, that, that uh, the purchasing power parity is a very, very long-term concept. So I, I wouldn't, um, we, we had it there in 2014, actually above that, 140 to 150, mm -hmm. and, and then, um, after the, the ECB went into non-conventional measures in the summer of 14, it, it dropped to one, 105 at the low. Um, so I would, I would think that it would converge uh, to a level of, um, of 120, uh, maybe 125 in the medium term, that is over the next uh, two years or so, but that very much depending on central bank policy, both in the US and Europe. Perfect. All right. Um, unfortunately, it looks like that's all we've got time for today. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking our... Panelists, um, Joe Lethal, Michael Bryan, and Martin Lewis.